So now what I want to do is look at a particular network with, which was trained in a particular data set. So the data set this network was trained on is ImageNet. And as you can see in ImageNet, so this is basically the training set here. So you have an object class called Consomme and you have another object class called Alp. You have another one, which is Volcano. Here you have, right, so you have Starfish, stuff like that. So you have 1,000 object classes in all in this data set. And what the network does is just like with people before, we put in an image and what we want to get is we want to get an output uh, that says what kind of object is in this image. Uh, so here we have the first example. So this is the image and you can guess it what it is. So the correct answer is hey. And you can see, so Google predictions means Google net predictions. So this is the particular network. Uh, and as you can see, so the top five predictions. So if you want to think about in terms of the Zs, it's like the Zs with the highest values correspond to hey, soccer ball, and so on. Okay, so you can try another one. So let's do the dog. Uh, so uh, people usually say Bernese mountain dog, uh, and I can see kind of why, because it kind of looks like a Bernese mountain dog. Now the correct answer here is in fact uh, a Tibetan Mastiff, which if you actually look in the training set, Uh, you can see why people would think that. Uh, so uh, you can see why people would think that it's a, a, a Bernese mountain dog, but in fact, it's just a, 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 a Bernese looking uh, Tibetan Mastiff, as you can see uh, from the images there. Uh, it actually is, is correct. So you can see the Google predictions and Google actually guessed right. So Tibetan Mastiff is the first on the list. That means that the output that corresponds to Tibetan Mastiff was the largest, but in second place is actually uh, the Bernese Mountain Dog. So, okay. So before we had this theory about what neurons are doing in a deep network, right? So the theory was something like well, so the H1s, those are detecting things. Uh, those are basically templates over the image, right? So like maybe H1 matches like one particular class of appearances of a face and maybe H100 matches a different kind of class of appearances, but those might be classes of appearances of the same face. Like, so maybe like a face looking forward and a face looking that way of the same person. Uh, you could also imagine that those are templates that are matching small parts of the image, right? So maybe H1 matches like the corner of the eye or something, and then H100 match also matches the corner of the eye, but like facing the other way or something. And then the idea would be that in this layer, the H's uh, and this AC should actually be H12, H102. Uh, so in this layer, uh, what, what you would have is you would have neurons that look at the layer below and combine the evidence that was obtained by matching all those templates. So here we have 300 templates. So you combine the outputs for the matchers for each of the templates in order to say, oh, like this is this kind of face. Or if the, uh, uh, the H's in the first hand layer detect like small features of the image, maybe you combine them. So maybe you detect corners of eyes and then you combine that into detecting particular kinds of eyes or something, right? Kind of that correspond to a particular person. Uh, so that was kind of like the general theory, depending on the network, they would be detecting kind of maybe global templates, maybe they would be small local templates. Uh, so now I wanna look at a particular network that was trained on the ImageNet dataset, the one with the thousand outputs and see what neurons are actually detecting neurons that are deep in the network. So how to do that? So one way to do that is that's kind of kind of analogous to what people in neuroscience sometimes do, which is they kind of take a person, they stick them in, the, in an MRI machine, 
and they show them images and they kind of see what areas of the brain light up, as it were, so like where there's activity. Uh, so here what we'll do is we'll pick one neuron somewhere deep in the network, uh, kind of one at a time, we'll look at multiple neurons, and then we'll say, well, out of all the images in the training set, if I plug in the image, what would make the neuron activate the most, meaning like what would make its value be as high as possible. Okay, uh, so I should say kind of there's tricks uh, in kind of how the network was built that we have not discussed. Uh, so let's look at what we'll see. Uh, so this is from the uh, 2014 paper but by Matthew uh, uh, Zeiler and Ralph Fergus. Uh, so Here's what you see here. So in the upper left corner, for example, those nine images. So those are the nine images that activate one particular neuron. So kind of there is lots of neurons there. They chose one. Uh, one particular neuron, those are the nine images that activated the most. For another neuron, so here in this square, you have the nine images that activate a different neuron. So here in total, they looked at uh, 16 different neurons. So obviously kind of the network is much larger than that. There's much more than 16 neurons. They just chose 16 neurons. And what you see is that this one, for example, seems to be activating when there are orange patches in the image. This one seems to be activating when there are kind of circles in the image. This one seems to be uh, liking kind of lines in the image and seemingly kind of approximately vertical lines. So this is in layer, hidden layer number three. So here's hidden layer number four, and here you see more interesting stuff that's going on. So the upper left one uh, seems to be uh, detecting, well, not really dogs. It's more like things that kind of look like dog faces with like a dark stripe, a bright stripe, and a dark stripe, right? Uh, this neuron seems to be activating when there are wheels in the image. Uh, this one seems to be detecting kind of like weird round patterns. So in layer five, you get really interesting stuff, right? So there is one neuron which would activate when there is a unicycle in the image. There is another one which seems to specialize in creepy eyes. I'm not sure if this is an eye. Uh, but mostly creepy eyes. There is one for dogs. So you see kind of the deeper you go in the network, the more abstract in general would be the concepts that uh, uh, each neuron activates. So just because kind of the neuron combines evidence in layer four, five combines evidence from layer four, which in itself combines evidence from layer three. So you can kind of describe more complex concepts by saying, well, I'll I'll combine evidence from simple pattern matchers, and then I'll combine evidence over those things, and then I'll combine evidence over those things again. So the deeper you go into, into the network, the more, in general, the more abstract would be the category that each neuron would react to. I should say that a lot of the neurons in a neural network would not be interpretable in any way. They would just be doing something that's not clear what. So here's another thing that you can do separate from that in order to try to explain kind of how the network works, why does it output the things that it does. So for each pixel in the input image, you can ask, say, if I change this pixel a little bit, right? So I pick pixel J, how would that influence output I? So Imagine a network here, so you are plugging in the input X here, and you have like a hidden layer, you have another hidden layer, you have another hidden layer, and finally you have the output. So what I'm asking is, if I change X, so if I make this one, so X2 or whatever, if I make it a little bit higher, how would that influence this output? This is the same question as asking, what's the derivative of output I with respect to input J. Right? So this says I change, I make XJ a little bit higher. How does that influence output I? 
this is exactly this quantity, which you can actually compute. Okay. Now you can pick an output i, or it could be like a uh, uh, a neuron that's inside the network and not in the output layer as well. So you can pick one. So let's say we pick this one, and you can say, well, I'm just going to be computing the output i by dxj for every x. So x is a pixel. So at the end, what you get is as many of those things as you have access, right? So for each, so you compute like the output i by dx1, by dx2, and so on, you'll get kind of as many outputs as you have input pixels. So if you have as many of those derivatives, rather, as you have input pixels, you can, again, reshape them into an image and display them as an image. So we can see what that would look like over here. Uh, so in this case, what we're doing is we're picking a neuron that corresponds to cat. So you might imagine that there is another one that corresponds to dog and another one that corresponds to like horse or whatever, right? So we're looking at the cat neuron in a network that was trained on something like ImageNet. And we're looking at the cat neuron, so this would be this, by dx for every input x, okay? And then we're visualizing it. and what you'll get is this kind of thing. So you kind of, so here I should mention that gray corresponds to zero and then non-gray corresponds to non-zero. So what you see is that uh, kind of outside of the kind of silhouette of the cat, so over here, things are mostly gray. So that means that if you change a pixel somewhere over here, not going to make a difference to cat because kind of d cat d cat by d x i where x i is a pixel that's like in the corner it's going to be zero you change it it's not going to change the cat output on the other hand you see that over here things are non-zero so that makes sense like pixels that are way away from the object like if you change them, that's not going to change the output of the network, or at least intuitively it should not. So still, this image is kind of noisy. So there is an alternative way of computing things. So this is called guided back propagation. So if you apply guided back, back propagation, uh, you'll get an image like that. So what this indicates, so gray again is zero, so what this indicates is that most of what really affected the output, or at least kind of if you change the pixels there, it would affect the value of the cat neuron. So either you make it more likely or less likely, is mostly the eyes, right? So a little bit the face, you see the outline a little bit, but mostly the eyes. So kind of the two round eyes, if you change the pixel in the eye, that would really make a difference, well, uh, relatively speaking, uh, in terms of affecting the kind of how high the cat output would be. Okay, so I will now talk about what this guided back propagation thing is doing. So think about it this way. So you have like a cat image as an input, right? And you're interested in whether this pixel if you increase the value, so you increase the brightness a little bit, basically, right? Whether that, how that's going to affect the output of the cat neuron, okay? So intuitively, that pixel, like if you look at it this way, it could be counted as evidence for a dog ear over here, or it could be counted as evidence for a cat eye because this pixel is like part of the cat eye, or you could imagine it's like part of the dog ear, right? However, Kind of the way the network is built, evidence for dog is actually evidence against cat. So that means that when you try to increase the value, the intensity of that pixel, two things happen. You have more evidence for cat, we assume, because like this affects cat, but you also have more evidence for dog, which means less evidence for cat. So there's like conflicting evidence here. So one idea is to say, well, I only want to consider like positive evidence. I don't want to consider negative evidence. So keep in mind that like it could be kind of 
uh, an intermediate kind of thing as well, right? So like this pixel could be like evidence for a part of an ear, which kind of downstream would affect the evidence for dog ear. And then only then would it be kind of evidence for dog, which means evidence against cat. So the way this network, the, the network that we saw is built, like evidence for dog does not mean evidence against cat, but uh, in usually what you would have is you would have like, if you increase the value of dog, all things being equal, the value of the cat neuron will decrease. So here's one way to look at things. So rather than saying, if I increase XI a little bit, how is that going to affect P1, for example, or PM? What I want to do, uh, PM in this example. So what I want to do is I want to say, I just want to consider paths where all the edges are positive. So what does it mean for an edge to be positive here? It means that if I increase XI, HJ increases if, they, if this edge is positive. If this edge is positive, that means that if I increase at HJ, then HN is going to increase and so on. So what I want to say is I just want to consider positive evidence, not kind of negative evidence, which is like evidence against stuff. So I don't want to consider kind of the fact that if I increase XJ, that also increases evidence against this being a cat because it increases evidence for this being a dog. So I don't want to consider any path from XI to any of the H's here where the edge is negative because that means that you increase X, that makes like the, the uh, template detector in this layer be depressed. So it's evidence against this particular template being matched. I don't want to con consider that. So similarly, I don't want to consider any paths from HJ that eventually add, uh, go to PM where the edge here is negative because that means that like higher HJ means less evidence for whatever this is detecting, for whatever this is detecting and so on. Just don't want to consider it. I just want to consider all positive paths. So this is what guided back propagation is. So I'm not going to go into the details of how it's computed in practice, but in theory, although that would be very computationally expensive, what you could do is you could literally just say, I want kind of, I want to compute this quantity. Like if I change XI by a little bit, how much is P I'm going to increase, but I just zero out. I ignore all the paths between XI and PM, which involve negative edges. So in practice, because there are so many paths, that would be very computationally expensive. But this is literally what guided back propagation does. And then you kind of visualize this quantity, which again, kind of, if I change this one, how much is the cat neuron going to change? Ignoring all the paths which involve propagation of negative evidence. And what you get is this uh, very nice, much cleaner picture.